The road to WrestleMania is a very long and winding one, fraught with danger, as there are potholes that can destabilize even the most watertight of booking, and pay-per-view rest stops that can do more harm than good in the long run. So after the Royal Rumble proved to be a pretty decent success by all my concerns, hopefully Raw and SmackDown will be able to stabilize the ship and get us going along the Sea of Thieves. They'll take us to New Orleans. That's what I'm hoping, but my beliefs and hopes can be dashed within an instant. Raw and SmackDown, you have a lot to do, so let's get the hype train to WrestleMania rolling as I look and see whether you've done a solid job post-Rumble on this week's edition of Wrestling Rant. off this week with three brand new things. A theme song, a graphics package which looked amazing by the way, and Jonathan Coachman replacing Booker T on the announce team. Now Booker T was alright, he had a lot of times where he made you question what the hell he was actually even thinking let alone talking about, but I will give him some credit, sometimes he made me laugh and his astute observations were at their best great but at their worst horrifying. Coachman I was never the biggest fan of him in his original run. He was okay, but didn't really have any sort of enthusiasm outside of, oh my god, I'm excited all the time. But hopefully now he's been at ESPN and had all of his happiness and soul removed, logically he's going to fit right into WWE's incredibly bland announced team setups, if you're not Corey Graves, obviously. Then again, Coach, I have one tip for you after this past week. Move your headset microphone closer to your mouth. There were sometimes I could barely even hear you. Then again, you were holding microphones for good portions of it, so what the hell can I say? We move on to the first segment of the evening where Stephanie McMahon hyped up a brand new match, the first ever women's elimination chamber, and taking all the credit for women's wrestling like all the smarts say. Oh, she didn't do it at the Rumble, but she has done here, and I know people are going to be pissed. Asuka did her usual promo to hype up her victory, which was fine, except I have a couple of problems. Speaking of foreign language, near an American audience is going to result in bad things. Look at what happened with Rey Mysterio speaking Spanish at any point, and you'll see my point there. And on top of that, Stephanie McMahon was slightly insensitive when she said to Asuka, when she was pointing at the WrestleMania sign, that's a language I can speak, that is so insensitive I want to punch you. And then Triple H will beat me into another lifetime because he's scary. Then Sasha Banks came out and, well, good heel shtick. We're getting a match that really should be a WrestleMania worthy caliber one, but we're getting it on Raw instead. I haven't got a problem with that because I could probably watch these two wrestle any day of the week together and it'd be probably something fun. Either way, a good segment to kick off the night had a few road bumps along the way, but it was fine enough for me not to worry about it. We then went on into the last man standing match for the Elimination Chamber qualifying match for the men this time, as Braun Strowman defeated Kane. Now, this match started off the commercial break in media res, and if you have no idea what that is, it's when they start something midway through. There's no narrative structure normally, it's just cut right to it, no starting and beginning. It's simple. And the fact is, I hated this because it really kind of diminutized the hype that the match had come to. This is the end of their feud, supposedly. I want it to have some heat. Unfortunately, it didn't, and logically, it was quick, short, it was a squash match for Braun. It would have gotten a strike if he didn't flip the whole announce table set up over, though. Whew. Guys in the chamber, run. Don't worry about Cena, do not worry about the big dog. Worry about the monster among men, because he is going to rip your head off and shit down your neck, to quote Sergeant Hartman of Full Metal Jacket. That is going to happen if you don't get the hell out of his way. Or just lie down and let the man pin you, because I want to see Strowman at WrestleMania fighting Lesnar again. And this time, hopefully we'll go the right way in terms of results. Hopefully. Now, following straight on from that, there was a backstage segment. <laughs> because an elongated shot of an announce table was enough for us to go to a commercial break off nothing and fill lots of time. That was another bad thing I could have given it a strike for, but it was too entertaining to worry about. Kurt Angle shouted at Strowman saying, you're putting people's lives in danger. And I love it when Kurt Angle gets angry and animated because he sounds fantastic. He sounds like he gives a crap and it's brilliant. Strowman just didn't care. And I, ha I have this analogy here, which is quite good. An announce table 
costs around a couple thousand dollars, right? Kane's health insurance bill? Probably in the tens of thousands. Kurt's reaction overall, priceless. Seriously, Kurt, I love the fact you're GM, and I hope you don't get taken out of that position, because you're brilliant at it. Keep on keeping on, my man. You are great. And we go into the first match of the evening proper, that actually had both men getting entrances, if you want to know what that bloody is, which was Elias taking on Woken Matt Hardy, who of course, Michael Cole mentioned, he had his day in court, and he's now officially Broken Matt. Yet they never actually mentioned it throughout the entire process of the night, so... What kind of bullshit is this? Either way, it was not the most exciting match as Elias won out. I, I liked Elias' intensity, but the match just didn't have much going for it. I wasn't intrigued. I, knowing that Bray Wyatt was going to interfere at some point, it was predictable as all hell. And overall, I just was bored. The, the song I obviously skipped, outside of Elias as an imposing in-ring talent, this didn't do anything. And Matt is stagnating because all they're doing is focusing on the freaking laughter. Make something of this. Because we can't have another two months of laughing. We need more substance. And as a result, everything here gets a strike. And I may be quite cruel, but I'm not the biggest fan of Elias. Woken Matt has stagnated beyond all sense. Bray Wyatt is literally doing nothing. The entirety of this, outside of the process of getting one man inside the Elimination Chamber, did nothing for me. And as a result, it has to go forth with an X on its forehead, branded for all eternity. And we go into something following that that I also hate, in equal measure, those bloody phone promos are here to stay, and this time they're happening on Raw. But the person like Miz can make it work, and he did. His awesome promo shtick, the fact is, that kind of promo with his phone works with his character. He's a smarmy, tech-savvy Hollywood asshole. Logically, that would work. So keep it with him and you're in good stead, but... Everybody gets it, and you'll see why when I analyse Smackdown later, that this is a really bad idea. All in all, coming into the second hour, this is a good thing for Miz to do. I just wish they didn't do it for everyone else. As we go on to the Intercontinental title rematch, as The Miz defeated Roman Reigns, and it was a dominant performance by Reigns, as you would expect, having lost the Rumble match, he would expect him to win, right? His knee was worked on superbly by Miz, and it was sold well by Reigns, it was limping, screaming in pain, and the match had a lot of story in it, which was exactly what I bloody needed after the last two matches they've had were a bit lacklustre, despite being relatively solid. And of course, the Miz Raj interfered, Miz retained, Roman is probably going to go into the chamber, and it was a solid program overall, where Roman actually lost it. When, did, when does this happen? This is really, really weird. And that's what makes it so good. Miz, though. I hope he becomes WWE Champion in the future, because he needs to be, because he's bloody white gold at this point. He needs to be in a better position than this. Then again, I'd love to see him in a WrestleMania program with that championship against a babyface we actually like. And again, on Raw, there aren't that many. So who is going to fill that role? Lord knows. Either way, the match was pretty good. And we move on to the next one, which is the Revival versus Heath Slater and Rhino. Now, again, it's a random tag match with psychology and aggression throughout it because they worked Slater's arm and beat the piss out of him and they gave Rhino a hiding as well and that is not a euphemism, it's a legit fact. This match was fun. <laughs> it's the fact that I can watch the Revival wrestle and I can hear them speak, but their theme song sucks dick. And logically, you'd expect that to do so. Then again, their promo afterwards, even better. Lambasting the fans living in the ECW shadow that they've been in for 20 plus years. That is brilliant. Whilst also mentioning a tag team that most of us weren't alive for. Some people were, to see the Grahams wrestle, but people like me, who were born in 1991, haven't. And the names are like, I recognise the names, <laughs> but at the same time, I have no recollection of what kind of style of wrestling and matches you're actually thinking of, sirs. Either way, though, like I've said in the last couple of weeks, give them a good feud and they will rocket up the Raw Tag Team ladder. Especially if Titus Worldwide getting a shot tonight is the closest the bar I have to an actual threat. Give me the Revival versus the bar at WrestleMania, then by turning Seamus and Cesaro face, then you have something that I'll be immensely excited about. 
We then go on to another phone promo where Finn Valor and his club did their thing. And you know what? I can also give this a pass too, because Gallows and Anderson's hyping and warming us up to a gradually more intense and more bitter Finn Balor doing his job by saying Cena took my chance at the championship that I'm having to be forced to do away from me. And it was good. I just wish they weren't doing this match on Raw, because that was that's a WrestleMania for you waiting to freaking happen, people. Either way, the segment was fine and I can live with that. But then we get to, um, yeah, something that I really don't like WWE doing, and that's having a promo right before a match is set to begin. Because it's there to pad out unnecessary holes in the narrative that they think are there. Do we really need Sasha Banks repeating what she said in the opening segment? No, not at all. Not at all in a million years. And it hurts my head to know that this is a thing. Strike two. There's no question about it. Because this is a segment that had no purpose being on the show. You don't need to have Sasha repeating what she's already said. So what if you miss the first hour? You can catch it up on freaking YouTube, and there are people who can tell you what Sasha Banks said. You don't need to have another thing. It's a three hour show and they're filling it out with that. I'm not happy with it. But we do get to go to Asuka versus Sasha Banks, and it was a hard-hitting physical match that was constantly in high gear, despite a slow start, hindering it to begin with. Well, to say it was in high gear from the get-go was a bit of a fumbling problem, just like the spots that they did. Sasha Banks nearly broke her neck falling off that spot that she did, which really made me cringe. Then you've got Asuka hurting her neck and back off that. Good Lord Almighty, it's just a match on Raw, women. Please. Don't hurt yourselves. The match was good, showed the ruthlessness and drive of both women superbly, while Asuka went that extra mile to kick the crap out of Sasha. Yeah, saying, yeah, you you were the one who came fighting, you're bound to bloody regret it, and it worked superbly. This should have been on pay-per-view, in my opinion, but hey, if it makes my Raw entertainment this week good, then I really shouldn't complain as we head into the third hour. John Cena did a phone promo now, and again... This type of promo is rubbish unless you've got a person on the other side who can talk. John Cena did. It was entertaining. It got me hyped for the match later on in the evening. That's all I needed. And yeah, we can move on to the next thing. I don't have to explain any more than that. The bar facing Titus Worldwide for the Raw Tag Team Championships. And what has been a very wrestling heavy show this week. We have, of course, the tag team title match that the Titus Worldwide need but thanks to predictability and the fact that the bar had just won the freaking titles back meant that this could not be one that I would enjoy as much. I preferred last week's match because the unpredictability of it and the threat and strength of Titus Worldwide in general was good. And overall the match was serviceable, it was watchable, and watching Shameless being dropped on his neck, which of course he's had recent stenosis issues with, holy mother of god that made me freer for him, and his wincing in pain at the end was highlighted as such. He was nearly crying, for God's sake. Overall, this match was fine. It's definitely avoided being a strike because it served its purpose. Titus Worldwide looked good, the bar looked good in retaining, and overall the match was entertaining enough. I just wish that it wasn't so predictable, otherwise I would have been more happy with it overall. Then, we get to the end of Raw with the main event. The Elimination Chamber qualifier between John Cena and Finn Balor. Again, this has been a very, very heavy wrestling show. This, like I said, should be saved until WrestleMania, because you have John Cena taking away Finn Balor's opportunity of getting a championship, when, of course, Balor has not been given a title match that he bloody deserves due to him not losing the Universal Championship. He needs to get that title shot, while Cena can walk in and get any big match he wants. There is a built-in feud there, rising Finn up to main event, main event, big-time stature at WrestleMania. Can you imagine Finn versus Cena at Mania with all that hype and all that build to it? over who deserves stuff more, a legend who's been there and done it all, and a guy who really has been robbed out of his luck. You know, there's something good there, and they wasted it by having it happen here. Or, you could have Balor Club sabotage the uh, Elimination Chamber, <laughs> and put a stipulation match on it where if Cena loses, he has to leave the company. You know, I can book better than the WrestleMania card that's been rumored by Meltzer. 
give me something, I'm happy to do some work. Now, the match was great and it flowed well, showcased both men as a tense battle of technical one-upsmanship turned into a very frantic run for victory, which Cena took beautifully with a second rope AA. Now, again, like I said, Cena's going to the chamber. We don't know who he's facing at Mania, but I'm hoping Balor and his club get something fun to do because it's going to need to be interesting. They need to be doing something good. Then again, this match was a really nice way to end the show. Balor got put over in losing, which is exactly what you need to do for this kind of thing. And Cena, just being Cena, is the wild card going into the Elimination Chamber because no one knows what's going to happen with him. And we still have three slots to fill next week, and that's a good thing to know. And Raw, you finished on two strikes this week. It was a bit of an up and down show with some things that were not really to my taste but were solid enough to get you through and there were a couple of segments that you just could have easily just lopped off entirely but overall a pretty solid show a pretty good one actually smackdown now it's your turn the blue brand kicked off this week with a shinsuke nakamura promo featuring Sami Zayn, kevin owens and aj styles resulting in a tag team match being made for the night shinsuke nakamura's simplistic yet unbelievably charismatic promo was lovely the heels crying foul in the best most passionate way they can beautiful aj styles doing his usual babyface stick it did a thing but it wasn't to my taste but the rest of the promo was good enough for me to like it and of course we go into the next segment wondering one thing who the blue hell decided to have Rockstar emblazoned across the entire freaking screen during Shinsuke's pose? I'm going to be complaining about this kind of thing all night. It didn't do anything to enhance my experience, and it looked terrible. Now, going on from that, we had a segment featuring Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and Daniel Bryan, where not only was the match for tonight officially confirmed outright, but also the knife was twisted in as our supposed corrupt general manager sided with Shane for once and decided to have these two best friends fight each other for a title match. That is exciting. There is storytelling abound here. I am looking forward to seeing how this works. Then again, they could also lie down at the same time and pin each other with both shoulders to the mat and technically screw it over. If you've not heard that theory for the upcoming match this week, you've heard it here first. That was a nice promo, added some really nice thematic bubbles to the potion that is SmackDown storytelling, and I'm happy with it. We then had a fatal four-way match for the number one contendership for the US Championship next week, as Rusev defeated Xavier Woods and Zack Ryder and Jinder Mahal, a very mixed bag of people, as Corey Graves' anger at the New Day continues, which still makes me laugh my ass off as he's assaulted by pancakes, it's the best thing ever, and Bobby Roode had a kick out of it on commentary as well. Solid, if benign in its execution on his end. Now, the match was fun, shifting the momentum, but lacking in energy, as the crowd seemed burnt out from the weekend, and obviously they were happy that Rusev won, and the match overall had enough going on for it, where it was actually quite fun, even though I had no idea who was going to win it. I thought it was going to be Jinder. <laughs> but no, it was it was Rusev. That's great. And Bobby Roode, it was all fine, I guess. He's happy to be facing Rusev. It's a big match. But I don't think Rusev's going to win it in the long run. So we'll have to wait and see until next week. Someone might screw Roode. You never know. Now, we move on to a backstage promo, or a phone promo, so to speak. I couldn't tell which one it was, as the Usos t said some stuff which was great. Their mic work is fantastic. However, whoever decided to put that text on screen, it works for the style of promo that Usos were doing in the location they're in. That kind of thing works for them. Other people? Not so much. I can let it slide, but not by much here. Then we had a Fashion Files segment with Gable and Benjamin. Now, a Fashion Files segment on SmackDown Pinch me, that's awesome. However, the segment felt a little flat, a little silly, and I was expecting to give it a strike because it wasn't going to do much. Game of the Benjamin showed up, and it went in a completely different direction than I actually expected. Brilliant. And overall, that was fun. They have their party poopers with chips on their shoulder, and the usual antics of the Ascension trying to give the Breezango team a nice pep talk to go, you know, you guys got this. You guys are going to go out there and make yourselves good. You're going to look great. Wait a minute. Are they doing the exact same thing that he, Slater, and Rhino are doing, but with teams? If so, originality is gone, and therefore it sucks. If that is indeed the case, next week I may give it a strike, but I was being kind this week. 
SmackDown to begin with, and the very elongated first hour we had, good lord almighty, went on for an Usos in-ring promo. Now, the Usos, great on the mic, as I've already noted here this evening on this review. Problem with that, though, whoever decided to put those cage door overlays onto that, again, much like the Rockstar thing, needs to be fired. I'm a person who makes all of these videos from scratch myself. I am a freelance video editor. I am a production professional. I would never do that on anything unless it creatively highlighted as such. WWE, you are a million, a multi-million dollar company. This makes your presentation look like garbage. I will rant on it more later, but this, this ruined a great promo. It took me out of the moment and it really annoyed me. Thank God I like the Usos mic work enough to where this segment can get a pass. Jesus, but the passes didn't last long as we saw the Bludgeon Brothers who came out after said promo to defeat some jobbers. Now, do we really need some frequent repetitive squash matches where these guys showcase their power? It's getting tired after seeing many months of it going back to December or even November before that. The fact is, it's not really that useful. I want to see the Bludgeon Brothers destroy the division and say, look, you, the Usos, have no one else to beat. Now it's just us in the way of you, and that's great. But this happening week in, week out, even in a singles competition mindset, isn't what needs to be done. And therefore, for me, it gets the first strike of the evening. I'm, I know that the Bludgeon Brothers are actually old school heel team needs to win this way, but... I, I need something more after months of this. I need something more because Ryback had the same problem when he came in in 2012 and we need something better overall. And what we didn't get was something better after that because Brian announced his top 10 ranking system voted on by the fellow wrestlers. Now, this announcement of something interesting could have been done with more pizzazz and aplomb. But instead, we've got that stupid smartphone promo and the awful text stuff ruining everything. And this was a game changer on how SmackDown can be run. The presentation of it made it seem like an afterthought. If you want to stick this stuff on social media, this kind of text is kind of okay. Because it's what you expect from a social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr post. That's the kind of video that needs it. You, again, stick it on a multi-million dollar company's production budget, and it's terrible. It's terrible. It is absolutely atrocious. And, again, I had to criticise it, because, again, that segment could have been great. But Daniel Bryan's over-enthusiasm with this corny dialogue, the bloody things on screen, it was appalling. And I'm going to give the second strike of the night in quick succession, because there's no point me sitting here and telling you all that I'm going to smile and say this is a good thing. The idea behind the standings is a good one. This presentation is not. And we move to a Ty Dillinger Baron Corbin backstage segment where of course uh, it could have gone absolutely nowhere but Dillinger shot from the hip and reminded Corbin that he lost the money in the bank which, ah, oh, storytelling as it made Corbin who was already annoyed, already frustrated and pissed off even more so. And that's great for me. It builds up and Shane was like, yeah, dude, you really shouldn't have mentioned that. Oh, yeah, truth hurts though. And it's like, Dillinger gave no fucks. And that is brilliant. That is what I want from a character like him. Too bad we don't see much of him because I really do like Ty Dill Dillinger. Blech. It's a confusing name. Overall, the segment did its job, even though it could have easily gone completely and utterly in the wrong direction. Good, and we also have a match later on tonight. Fantastic! Love that. We go into the second hour with a Renee Young, Charlotte Flair in-ring interview. Now, Charlotte's par for the promo. Great! Ruby Riots, however, upon her coming out, is one of the worst executed promos I have seen in ages. Holy crap. Now, I was going to give this segment a strike because of how poor that was. The beatdown afterwards was a little elongated, but noted. I'll take that. That saved this segment from bombing completely, so... I'll take that, and that's fine with me. We then go to a Nakamura Styles backstage segment, and this was lovely. We had Shinsuke Nakamura playing mind games of AJ, and I was, I was laughing my arse off, because I'm like, 
Shinsuke, you have some chutzpah to do this now, months before you've even got the match. Brilliant. Oh, again, the King of Strong Style has balls the size of grapefruits. It's br it's great. And I'm hoping he can main event WrestleMania like he did Wrestle Kingdom. That's all I'm hoping for. Because if he doesn't main event WrestleMania knowing he's this bloody awesome, then what the hell am I going to do? And then, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to mention something else that happened before that segment, because it will tie in nicely to what I'm about to talk about. In that women's segment, Carmella attempted a cash-in. It was botched because she accidentally missed hitting Charlotte with a drop kick and hit the referee out. The referee actually got concussed and was knocked out completely. So yeah, that's one way to mess up a potential title change, eh? The fact is that was that was another thing that made me not strike that women's segment because it, it had a lot more good for it than it, the one massive bad it had. So I'll give it there. However, the follow-up is a little more protracted, as we had Carmella talk with Renee. The, the problem I have here is the presentation of it. Because Baron Corbin had already made his, oh, this is Baron Corbin, Tyne Dillinger, sorry, made his entrance for his match with Corbin, and they cut to Carmella talking with Renee. Not just that, they also have the replay with full volume on, so I couldn't hear Carmella speak. Which means the entire reason of that was wasted. It was pointless, it was stupid. And it was for me a showcasing of how appalling Kevin Dunn and his team have performed tonight. They have ruined a SmackDown that should have been relatively fine. Because I was okay with quite a few bits that have happened on this show. It's just the fact that their presentation choices made me get so angry that I phased out of what was important on the show. Because, ladies and gentlemen, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, is it not? And these kind of things annoy the crap out of me. It's a third strike, and that is the review done. Smackdown was let down by Kevin Dunn's teeth. To quote Ross, I know that that is his stick, but it's true. Kevin Dunn, stop doing things that you think are amazing. This is the kind of thing that puts the programs in the toilet for a reason. Also, improve the creative writing of some angles while you're at it. Maybe you'll get some other things done. This was appalling. And with that, we have to go through the rest of the evening. Just briefly. A simple victory for Baron Corbin over Dillinger, even though Dillinger showed he had resolve and fought through. Also, another production niggle. Why the hell can't Baron Corbin's music be louder? Tommy Vexed is too good to be very, very quiet. When I hear it at WrestleMania, I hope to God I don't have to perk up my ears to hear one of the best metal vocalists in the world be speaking out on a WWE thing. We had another phone segment, this time with Rusev. Good lord, I hate these. They add nothing to proceedings. Save it for social media, you asses! Please, please, you're hurting me. I'm a person who white likes graphic packages, promo videos that are well edited and made. Stop killing me with these really poor amateurish things. This is the kind of stuff you expect from a YouTuber who's got very few subscribers, not a wrestling company with a worldwide audience of nearly 40 million. Or more, depending on what the things are. It's just stupid. And the same freaking idea goes for Bobby Roode. His promo writing glorious over Rusev Day on the calendar would have been lovely if the text wasn't on screen and it didn't cut to a Bobby Roode freeze frame thing. That is just... Kevin Dunn. I know people who work on making YouTube videos who can do better jobs than you do. <laughs> and I'm not using that as a way to inflate myself. I am legitimately stating... There are people making YouTube videos with over 100,000 subscribers or more, even in this wrestling community, who could pull this shit off better. Good lord. Ladies and gentlemen, this pisses me off so much, it makes me want to punch things. I'm supposed to get things through this quickly, but I'm ranting. This is why it's called Wrestling Rant, people, because when I bloody do, I go off like a bloody hatchet. Ugh. Overall, we follow up that up with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn backstage. The segment highlighted and started their dissension, and well... It led into the match later, which was lovely. Now, of course, we got an easy win from Sunday's defeated challenges against Brizango with Gable and Benjamin picking up an easy victory. I would have given that a strike because, eh, it's a tag match with no story added. But then we get to the main event. The match was decent. 
the fractions between Owens and Zayn were sewn, but it went through really fast. It reignited so quickly that it doesn't feel impactful at all. The next SmackDown pay-per-view is in is in mid-March, so you have time to stretch this out, make it interesting. But no, they they went through with it at the end of the show. And and Zayn said that his friendship with Kevin Owens is not over, despite the fact he's angry with him and left him at ringside to be beaten up. Okay, flawed logic. I want to see how next week addresses that. Oh, God. Overall, though, I look at SmackDown and say, Kevin Dunn ruined you this week. There was a solid show in here. Kevin Dunn and his production team and their stupid decisions to liven up SmackDown Good God Almighty have made the blue brand have massive egg on its face. Because Raw was not the most spectacular show in the world, but it did enough to get by with two strikes. Kevin Dunn ruined that by getting three almost entirely on his own. So yeah. It's obvious who won this week, and it is Monday Night Raw. There is no question on this one. And I'm hoping SmackDown hear all the negativity regarding those things, and they address them and give SmackDown a new graphics package like they did Raw. Because that's what they need after two years of the same theme song and the same thing. SmackDown deserves what Raw can get. Not some shoddy social media, WhatsApp, Snapchat, text things and filters and stuff. We don't need that. And overall, I'm left at the end of this review annoyed as all hell. And I'm hoping next week can be a Hell of a lot better than this. I'm worrying that I'm not going to get what I want, but considering SmackDown has a big match for number one contendership and the US title match, the blue brand has something to offer, while Raw continues to build up for the Elimination Chamber and gives me some more Chamber qualifiers. Which makes me question, if you need qualifiers for an Elimination Chamber, why the hell didn't you have them for the Rumble? Either way, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this more angrier than usual wrestling rant, living up to its name pretty well. I hope you have enjoyed. If you do like this video, click that button down there. It would be greatly appreciated. And if you don't want to miss a single one of these videos in the future, the subscribe button is down there. And I would very much appreciate you clicking on it because the support matters immensely. So with that in mind, I am hoping for much better from SmackDown next week and Raw if you keep up with what you're doing, I'll be relatively impressed. And yeah, you re recouped yourself from Raw 25. But WrestleMania is soon. I need to be entertained. Because I'm spending all that money to go there. I want it all to work. I have been Freddie Thomas. You have been people watching. This has been another edition of Wrestling Ramp for the CC Network. And I will see you all next time.